Hello, welcome to our fourth session in our five-part study on the spiritual gifts. It has been an exciting study, and I'm just raring to jump right into it. So, let's review where we've been in the previous three sessions. First of all, we learned that the spiritual gifts are spiritual in nature, and therefore the person, human, using them or receiving them must also be spiritual. This first means that that person has gone from spiritual death to spiritual life by placing their faith in Jesus Christ alone for salvation. It is at that moment that we are born again, we are made alive in Christ, and we're spiritually now uh, able to have access to the God of the universe by his grace. We also find that we're indwelt by the gift of the Holy Spirit, and it is the Holy Spirit himself that empowers all of these things to go forward. So we must be spiritual. And as we saw in that study, being spiritual has nothing to do with sitting on top of a mountain or balancing on top of a pole or uh, not eating food for extended periods of time, nor does it have to do with being isolated forever or speaking in confusing platitudes. Being spiritual means having a vital relational connection to God through the Holy Spirit. That is how we are spiritual in nature. It means we're in constant fellowship with the Lord. So the spiritual gifts we find are spiritual in nature. The next thing we studied is that they are gifts. They are freely given by God, and they are given with the express purpose of building up the body of Christ. So they're gifts. They're free. We can't ever be proud of them. We don't use them for our sense of identity. And they also uh, have a specific purpose, and that purpose is not to lift or glorify us uh, in any way. They are meant to glorify Jesus Christ through their exercise and build up the body of Christ, the church. And so we saw that the purpose of all the spiritual gifts will be to be utilized within the context of the church in order to build up to prepare the saints for the work of ministry, whether those are gifts of mercy that encourage and support people as they in their hour of need so that they can minister, or that's gifts of, of again, teaching, exhortation, leading, helps, whatever. So that's what we'll be looking at today, having found out that the gifts are spiritual, that they are, in fact, gifts. They're not something that we uh, ascertain or get for ourselves or earn more of. They are grace gifts of God to use us in a, in a particular fashion. Um, they're not a part of our identity, and we saw that the purpose of those gifts will be to build them up. So now we can jump into Romans chapter 12, which is a wonderful passage that tells us, uh, gives us some more specific information. This is one of the passages that actually has a, a slightly more in-depth or expansive list of gifts. And this list of gifts uh, is not exhaustive. And we'll go over, we'll go over and look at... Uh, First uh, Corinthians 12 through 14 next week. And we'll find out, or in our next session rather, and we'll find out in that case that we will not uh, have an exhaustive list there either. But these lists are given to be demonstrative or give us an example of what types of gifts are or were in function at the time. So, but we must start with Romans 12, 1 and 2. You see, Romans is a magnificent book. It is in so many ways the, the centerpiece, the most the single place that you would go in order to find and understand the Christian faith clearly. So what we see in, a fee, in Romans, rather, is that Romans chapters 1 through 8 are describing the gospel, what Jesus Christ came to do, our position in Christ, how the believer is meant to walk by faith, to reckon in the completed work of Christ, to reckon ourselves to be dead indeed into, uh, into sin and alive unto God through Christ Jesus. We see that um, eight through, or 1 through 8 tells us everything that we're meant to know or, or much that we're meant to know about what it means to be saved by grace through faith, the whole world under sin. It gives us all that information, a wonderful, logical, line-by-line, uh, -line, uh, reasonable way. R Romans 9 through 11 give us the information that about Israel, because believers, both Jewish believers, that Paul would be receiving Paul's letter to the Romans, because there were many Jews in Rome, who would become Christians, and Gentile believers would both have the same question. But God made all these promises to the Jews. How can we trust him to keep his promises to us if he just basically said, hey, Jews, you're out, sorry, about all those promises of a kingdom and prosperity and, you know, the Messiah reigning as king and kings and lord of lords over all the world. Hey, just sorry about that, but you, you know, you kind of forfeited that when you they were unconditional promises. And so Romans 9 through 11 give us a clear, 
simple understanding and explanation of the reality that God is not done in his plan for Israel and his plan for the Jews, and that in his due time, through the supernatural workings of God in the end times, which we won't look at uh, in the scope of this study, but in the end times will draw Israel back to himself, and indeed Israel will be saved, and God will fulfill every promise that he made in the Old Testament to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob, to David, through Moses and the like. So, and through the prophets, will all be made yes in Christ in a yet future time. So having dealt with that, uh, Paul moves in Romans 12 to what we might call the practicality of walking out our faith. He told us how to, especially in Romans 6, 3, how to walk with Christ, how to grow in Christ. But then in Romans 12, he gives us what that is going to look like. But before he does, before he kicks into that very practical uh, information, much of which we'll see today, because the spiritual gifts are part of that, he starts with Romans 12, 1 and 2. He says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your body as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Now we have a pitfall that we have to be very mindful of, is that we're here to talk about the, the uh, spiritual gifts, and yet these verses are so beautiful and so encouraging and so important that it, uh, it, it is a temptation for me to spend much or too much of our time here. So we must just give you a brief overview because we can't jump into the next verse where he starts talking about spiritual gifts unless we have a good understanding of these verses the context of where he's coming from. So first of all, Paul is beseeching here, parakaleo, this idea of calling alongside. He's, he's uh, urging them or even pleading them with, with them in a sense, saying, hey, we all are going to do this. We need to do this together. Come alongside me. I encourage you to do this. It's interesting that in this case, he doesn't use command because that would give a sense that they had to do something that he wasn't uh, needing to do or doing. But in this case, no, he doesn't command. He he urges them. He, he, he calls them alongside himself. He counsels them to do this. And he says, therefore, brethren, again, he draws on their family uh, relationship in Christ because we're all brothers and sisters if we've uh, trusted in Christ of our Heavenly Father by the mercies of God. So here we have the motivation. The mercies of God is God's incredible mercy in sparing us of our due punishment, and his grace is giving us this new position. He's saying, being mindful constantly of the, the hell and the doom from which you have been saved, that will motivate you into this new life. And this new life is to be marked by here, presenting your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God. So this means uh, presenting our, our bodies, or in other words, our members, as a, not a dead sacrifice, we're not meant to, uh, to uh, partake in human sacrifice, but rather a living sacrifice. So just as the sacrifice is wholly uh, given over to its work on the altar, so our lives are meant to be as a daily affair entirely uh, presented to God in every sense. And interestingly, this uh, the key to understanding this verse is all the way back in Romans 6. I think that's what he's re uh, mentioning. And it says here in chapter 6, verse 12 and 13, it says, Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body, that you should obey its uh, lusts, and do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive, uh, from the de uh, from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not have dominion over you. You are not under law, but under grace. So, here this uh, same word "present" is used. I believe to cast us back to say that no, we're presenting the members of our body, presenting your hands, presenting your mind, presenting your heart, presenting your uh, movements and your feet, and just everything about your daily life before the Lord as a living sacrifice. It's holy. It's holy because Christ died to purify it. It's acceptable to God. And it is reasonable service. It is a reasonable response to what God has provided and given us entirely by his grace. He doesn't say that it's um, the required response. It's just the only response that makes any sense. From all, when we consider all that God has saved us from and all that God has saved us to in knowing him and in growing forever in him, it only makes sense that we would long to respond with that desire to glorify him, to serve him in everything that we do. 
Uh, verse 2 continues, And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So, here we have a dual process. We have the world trying to put pressure on us from the outside to conform us into its pattern. But it says, don't be conformed into this the pattern that this world is trying to press us all into, that satanic and ungodly pattern that uh, will obscure the word and the will and the nature and the morality and the truth of God, but rather we are to be transformed. Metamorpho is where we get the word metamorphosis. In fact, the uh, the tales of metamorphosis by Ovid are some of the most interesting, that they're all marked by something transforming into something else. So here he's saying we uh, have one mindset, but we're actually not meant to be in our mindset or our ignorance and our lack of knowledge and our immaturity. We're meant to be transformed by renewing of our mind. The idea here, the picture here is of, if you like, of... Um, reformatting a computer hard drive, taking everything off of it and replacing it with the correct and unvirused operating system, if you like, of the perfect word of God. That's the, the picture here, that we might be able to be transformed in our, in our thinking completely by the renewing of our mind. How do we renew our mind? We fill it with the word of God. So, Tough day. Okay, here we go. So, what we see here as we continue on in our passage is, For I say, through the grace given to me and everyone who is among you, do not think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but think soberly as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. So, here Paul continues on, and he says that the, uh, through the grace given to him, to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than they ought. Here the picture of humility be, uh, comes critically important. We must understand how uh, we view ourselves and are meant to view ourselves. Tragically, one of the greatest problems in the church is that we start to think of ourselves more highly than we ought. We think of ourselves or our gifting or our spirituality as being greater than someone else's or maybe even everyone else's, and it starts to cause great difficulty and damage within the body of Christ. That arrogance is uh, foolish and, and horrific. It says, but to think soberly is a... Um, alternative. The alternative is to think soberly. Now, we think of sobriety often in terms of just the um, lack of drunkenness, and it does involve that, of course, but really soberly has the, sober has the idea of having a wise-mindedness. Okay, so for now, the idea of a of a wise mindedness that is able to consider all things and have a right relationship to the reality of the world around us, the objective reality of the world around us. So thinking soberly instead of arrogantly, and that's interesting that the opposite of being sober or being wise minded is being uh, thinking of ourselves more highly than we ought to think. This is as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. So God has given everybody a measure of faith. In other words, at some level, we all stand at the same, uh, on the same ground before the cross. This is important as we get into gifts because once we start talking about our gifts and our function in the body of Christ, that's when we start to, as humans, try to establish pe a pecking order of some kind. And that is undesirable uh, and, in fact, ungodly. Romans 12, 4 and 5 continues with this idea. It says, For we as we have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function. So we, being many, are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. So this is where he draws on the picture that we are the body of Christ. Christ is our head, and we are the body of Christ. Christ is, if you like, the command center for the church. And the body is meant to act as his hands and his feet, his heart and his mouth throughout the world, if you like mouthpiece throughout the world, and we are all members of one another. It's interesting, but we very frequently misunderstand the incredible uh, need that we have for others. Sadly, as technology becomes more and more ubiquitous and we have more uh, ability to live life, quote-unquote, on our own, or at least with the illusion of being on our own, I think we find ourselves in a quite a a terrible and terrifying quandary of isolating ourselves down. People uh, very frequently will take in all their teaching exclusively on the internet or exclusively from tape or CD. They'll take in all of their 
you know, even their worship in the car on the drive to work, which again, both of those things are wonderful things to do, but they're not substitutes for being amongst the body of Christ. I realize not everybody's situation is conducive to that. You may be shut in, you may be um, unable to, uh, for some legitimate reason, unable to meet with Christians on a weekly level. And we're not just talking about going to a church building, a place called church on a Sunday morning. I'm talking about sharing fellowship with other believers, whether it's in a home Bible study or it's but sharing, again, in what the body of Christ does. Sharing in the gifting, receiving the gifting of others, the spiritual gifting of others, or at least the benefits of the spiritual gifting of others, and utilizing your own gifts. We need to be in connection to each other. And the answer, the idea that the church would become insular or a bunch of fractured individuals who are so obsessed with their own privacy is a picture of a church that is horrifically broken and tragically Un, uh, unlike what God designed us to be. But we're meant to, in fact, look across the great differences, the great ver- diversity of gifting and personalities within the body of Christ and value each other for our difference. Now, now mind you, this is not diversity of doctrine. We're not meant to value diversity of different people's uh, teachings that are anti-biblical. In fact, we're to not tolerate that at all. But we are to tolerate our differences of, uh, of viewpoint, of, of personality traits, of gifting very much so, which is actually the point. Because again, we have a, a sad human tendency to say that the way I think is the way that everyone should think. And if you don't think the way I think, you're wrong. Now again, can't state this enough. I'm not talking about uh, biblical doctrine. I'm talking about just viewpoints and sort of like priorities, the way we like to do things, the way we like to see things done. We need to recognize that other people do things and like to see things done differently. Other people have different emotional and intellectual priorities, and we need that in the body of Christ so that we don't just become a dominated church of eggheads or a church of, uh, you know, feelers or a church of whatever it is that, that we might be tempted to become. We need to appreciate that diversity of viewpoint and opinion and appreciate one another because we're members of one another. We are united within the body of Christ. I always uh, told people, joking, half-jokingly at least, that if you can't have someone whose personality in the church you just can't stand, you better learn to get used to them because God, in his great sense of humor, might make them your roommate in heaven. And uh, then you'll have a long time to figure out how to, how to love and, and tolerate their differences. <laughs> Nevertheless, we move on with this picture, this viewpoint in mind, I hope, that we are members of one another and that our gifting is meant to build up, not tear down. It is meant to unite us in the body of Christ, not divide us in the body of Christ. Um, while there are significant you know, errors, theological errors that we can come across that demand division or, or someone departing from the body of Christ or being disciplined by the body of Christ, the purpose of the spiritual gifts is to be working towards us all achieving the unity of the faith coming together in Christ. And we will not achieve that unity. We will not uh, achieve what God has for us unless we are growing in that way. So then do we get to the 6 through 8, which has the sort of the list, if you like. It says, having then gifts differing according to the grace given to us, let us use them. If prophecy, let us prophecy in proportion to our faith. Or ministry, let us use it in our ministering. He who teaches in teaching, he who exhorts in exhortation, he who gives in liber- with liberality, he who leads with diligence, he shows mercy with cheerfulness. So we find that these gifts are um, are being listed. Here we saw prophecy actually in our last one, but the, the prophets um, in the New Testament era were specially gifted super teachers. The uh, Zodiadis Word Study Dictionary says of this word prophetia or prophetias, uh, that it is a prophecy or prophecy, uh, prophecy meaning the prophetic office, the prophetic gift spoken of in the New Testament of the peculiar peculiar charisma or spiritual gift imparted to the primitive teachers of the church. So there's this peculiar gift in absence of the word of God that the Lord brought up people who were expressly gifted to know the information that God would later reveal and codify through the books of the New Testament. But not having those, they had to rely upon these this uh, special time of gifts wherein the prophets were the ones 
who are giving the revelation that they would not have had access to yet because the Word of God, the, the Bible, or the New Testament books, many of them at this point, had not been written. Many of them had, but uh, certainly they wouldn't have had access to all of them. And just as we need the full counsel of God, so did they. So God gave this special dispensation, a special uh, gift to uh, the early church by giving specially and super uh, supernaturally empowered teachers with prophecy and knowledge. It goes on to say, or ministry, this is our, our word diakonos or diakonia or to serve. And it's the idea of a servant, or it's also where we get our English uh, transliterated word, the, a deacon. Or who, a deacon is just someone who serves the physical needs of the church. So it says if your gift is in ministry, if your gift is in service and serving others and caring for others, then uh, let us do so. Let us use that gift, that grace gift that is given to us in our service. So relying on Christ in how we serve and care for and look after the physical needs of others. He who teaches here is didasco, and the idea is to know something or to teach, to instruct by word of mouth. So he's saying the teachers use that spiritual gifting in teaching. This is very important, is that um, any human or most humans have the ability to relay information and tragically many so-called bible classes just do only that they relay simple information and yet there's so much more to the teaching ministry of the word of god there is a under making and using the gifting of the holy spirit to come to an understanding of the word of god and the great thing about that ministry is is that the Holy Spirit is working in the, in the teacher as well as in the learner in order to instruct, encourage, and bring everybody in the body of Christ to a greater understanding. He who exhorts is our word parakaleo again. It means to call alongside of or call to the side of. It can mean to aid, to help, to comfort, encourage. I love that all those words, all those English words, because we think of comforting someone in trouble as one thing and encouraging someone to you know, complete their task or helping someone. We think of those as sort of different nuances, but all that is is. Is, is in this idea. And here it's said of exhortation. So here exhorting people to uh, apply the word of God. But it has all these other senses as well built into it. The idea of one who is alongside. If you are uh, gifted as one who is alongside others, encouraging them, equipping them, comforting them. Next, he who gives with liberality. He, so the next gift that we have is metadidomai, which has the word meta or with and denoting didomi to give or to give gifts. So this is a person who is especially gifted with generosity, generosity beyond measure. And oftentimes the Lord does gift, give these people who are gifted with this special gift of, of generosity or giving. He gives them uh, great amounts of resources because he knows he can trust them with those great amount of resources. They won't just hoard them, but they'll in fact share them out and give them and put them in good godly places to serve him and to glorify his name. Next, he who leads, proestemai, it means to stand before, to stand in front. The person who stands in front or is set over the person um, is is uh, given a gift by God to lead, to uh, to again head up any kind of group or situation and is to do so with diligence. Gifts of leadership can be very, very dangerous because it can be easy once you've attained a position of leadership not to lead from the uh, point of spiritual uh, spirituality, not to lead from our uh, spiritual gifting, but try to lead from our self-will. And that's a terrible, terrible thing. And so that's why he says that anyone who's been gifted to lead others must do so with a very special diligence. Next, he who shows mercy, Eliao, or Elieo, has the uh, sense of mercy or showing mercy or compassion. And of course, we know these people in the church these are the people who are so wonderfully gifted to come alongside those who are hurting, those who are experiencing a difficult time. They're oftentimes the ones who will, uh, you know, show up at your door set up with chicken soup and you they didn't even know you were sick. <laughs> that they're so merciful that they're there to uh, suffer with, to care for, to love and to show mercy to people in their time of need. So here again, not an exhausted lift, exhausted exhaustive list, but a good list and a good picture of, of how this gifting works. And we consider this gifting. We see that these gifts, there are a couple different kinds of gifts. There are gifts that give information and explanation, teaching gifts. 
pastoral gifts, gifts of counseling that try to take the Word of God and help place it in the mind of others and understanding and, and hearts of others. Next, we have gifts that encourage and strengthen others, those that uh, lift up, that encourage, that care for in time of need, that build up uh, others uh, either towards greater growth and security or towards, um, uh, again, health from their time of, of injury or loss. And finally, we have gifts that cause us to serve others. And these are the gifts that are oftentimes most underrated, most tragically, but these are the people who show up and do things for the church, that is the church body, the people, or sometimes even the church building. And they just kind of are in and out without a trace. It's a, It's amazing as we've been the pastor at Fort Collins Bible Church for nearly a decade now, how many people who are gifted to serve and how wonderful it is to see them use those gifts and utilize uh, those gifts in, in ways that lift up and encourage and build up the body of Christ in, in such ways. So these ways in which the gifts are used are all according to that need, need and meaning of the gifts that we saw in our previous study or purpose for the gifts that we saw in the previous study. The purpose of the gifts is to build up the body of Christ. Whether they're gifts of information, explanation, teaching, whether they're gifts of encouragement and strengthening others, whether it's an exhortation, whether it's gifts of service to others and caring for their needs and caring for the weak and the hopeless and powerless amongst us, they are all building up the body of Christ. And again, they are spiritually derived. They come only from our connection and can be exercised only when we are in fellowship with the Spirit. And they are gifts. They are given by God at His pleasure, by His grace, so that whatever capacity in which we might function in our gifting will uh, undo, indubitably be not for our own glory, but to glorify God. So, what we find about these gifts is very special, is that m uh, most, if not all of them, have to do with what every believer is meant to do. You see, every believer is meant to be teaching and explaining the Word of God to his brothers and sisters, to his family, to the people who are around him. Every believer is meant to do that. Every believer is meant to show mercy. Every believer is meant to share the gospel, but some believers are especially equipped to do it. So thus, the uh, believer who is gifted as a teacher should be equipping other believers to teach the Word of God in their own context. A believer who is gifted with mercy should be and will inspire and encourage other believers to show that same kind of mercy and say, wow, that I saw in her the Spirit of Christ so powerfully as she showed mercy to that person in that situation that oh, I, I realize that I too can grow in Christ in that way. Um, so what every believer is meant to do, some believers will be especially equipped to do as we're empowered by the Holy Spirit. In other words, if you want to see your spiritual gifts flourish, and if you want to see if there may be spiritual gifts that you have not yet understood and received, then you need to be continually in fellowship with the Holy Spirit, and He will show you new ways in which He can use you every day. And it'll be used with the purpose of building up the body of Christ. Now, for the controversial part. The Holy Bible gives us no spiritual gifts test. There's no passage of the Bible. There's plenty that explain the gifts, but there's none that tell us how to tell which gift we have been given or which gifts we have been given. It's just not in there. It's strange because anytime the Word of God leaves silent, we silly humans have to develop them. So, We'll get all sorts of, and we've spoken about this before, all sorts of strange spiritual gifts tests, and we'd say that in air quotes, spiritual gifts tests that are really little more than a personality test, asking you, what do you like to do? What do you feel like you're good at? What do you, and on and on and on. And while that might be some valuable information, the reality is, is that you never need a spiritual gifts test to tell you what your spiritual gifts are. If you needed one, God would give you one. But... Being the fool that I am, I developed one anyway. So here is Brad Maston's patent pending, pending three-step, I'm just kidding, the patent is not pending. There's no patent. You can, you can have this. You can use this gift, this gift test anywhere. Three simple spiritual, three-step spiritual gifts test. Simple, it's just too many Fs. Three-step spiritual gift test. You ready? Step one in your spiritual gifts test is this, growing Christ. Be spiritual. Be in fellowship with Christ. 
If you have sin, confess that sin. Get it out of the way. Let the Lord uh, forgive you and, 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 and cleanse you and move on, right? Um, spend your time in fellowship with the Lord. Grow in Christ. Grow in the knowledge of his word. Grow in the trust of his revelation. Grow in uh, walking by means of the Spirit. Learn to trust in him with each passing day. Start uh, every day by fixing your gaze on Jesus Christ, by casting your attention to Christ, to what he's done to us, by spending your uh, hours and moments in prayer throughout your day and in dedicated time and otherwise, by reading the word, by being in fellowship with other believers. Step one to, dis to uh, discerning what your spiritual gifts are is that you must be growing in Christ, and then you'll be ready for step two. Step two is to look where the Lord has placed you. Has the Lord placed you in a situation where the, there are uh, many, many unbelievers? Well, it's not unlikely then that the Lord would gift you with the gift of evangelism. Has the Lord placed you in a church where you're surrounded with uh, great physical needs? Then it's not, wouldn't be shocking if the Lord would give you the gift of service or helps. If, if you've been placed in a situation wherein there's a need for administration in your church at some level, whether that's say for the church finances or whatnot, then it's not, it's not unlikely that the Lord would gift you based on the needs of that church uh, with gifts of help, uh, administration or leadership. You see what I'm pointing at here? Is that if you look around you and see what needs to be done around you and then prayerfully consider how you can be involved or how you can step in, it could very well be that that opening is just there and is being held there for you to know and learn what your spiritual gifting is. Finally, once you've got that figured out, step three, what do you find yourself doing? The Lord has gifted you to do something. You'll be compelled to do it. I can tell you this as a teacher of the Word of God. Woe unto me if I do not teach the Word of God. I can't keep it in. Honestly, if I, was, uh, if I lost this job and, and for whatever reason the church disappeared or had to go underground, I still could never stop teaching the Word of God, whether I had to work three other jobs to do it. I would always teach the Word of God. I can't not teach the Word of God. I'm compelled to because He's gifted me. So the question is, as you grow in Christ, what are you compelled to do? Are you compelled to exhort and encourage others? Are you compelled to show discernment and see where things are not quite right? Are you compelled to, to have mercy upon those who are most helpless and most hurting? Are you compelled by the Spirit of God to do one thing or the other, help administrate or do, uh, you know, help with the parking or help with the meals or whatever it is? What do you find yourself doing? There's your three simple spiritual gifts, the three steps, simple spiritual gifts test. One, grow in Christ. Two, look where the Lord has placed you. And three, Find what you or find what you uh, find out what you are compelled to do. I promise, you will see what the Holy Spirit has gifted you to do. With all this in mind, I hope we can go forward in the grace and growing ever in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. May God richly bless you this week.